Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, last time we stopped uh, talking about the uh, Bream's algorithm for finding minimum spending trees, and we uh, contrasted it to, uh, or we compared it to uh, Kruskal's algorithm for finding minimum spending trees. And we said there's lots of similarities. They're all based on this general greedy framework <clears throat> where you would uh, start from an empty set of edges and in each step, try to find an edge that crosses or the lightest edge that crosses a specific cut. And this is where the two methods uh, differ. They define uh, different cuts. In uh, Kruskal, it's uh, a cut that includes the set of nodes of one of the connected components that you're trying to add with a new edge or connect, connect with a new edge. And uh, in uh, Bream, it's basically a single tree that you're growing and you're always considering the nodes with within that tree in, in one part of this uh, partition and you take the cheapest edge that crosses um, this, uh, this cut. So this is essentially visualized here in this, in this figure here. And we went through an example uh, and, and checked how Prem would work on this uh, example graph. So at this point, I would start another uh, subchapter of greedy algorithms, give you another example of a very nice example of how greedy can and give uh, accurate solutions to important problems. Before I continue, is there any question uh, related to minimum spending trees, Kruskal, or, or Prem's algorithm? No? Okay. Then the next topic or uh, the next uh, uh, algorithm that we're going to look at is an algorithm to find uh, a binary encoding for a string. So if you think of MP3, MP3 format uh, tries to sample an audio signal at certain intervals, and then it takes the string and tries to encode this into a binary format. Um, and it tries to do this in a, in a way that's sort of safe space, meaning that you want to find an encoding of that audio uh, signal uh, of uh, minimum length. And this is uh, what we can do with so-called Huffman encodings. And this is what we're um, studying today. A uh, little sort of back, background uh, story. Maybe this is also sort of encouraging or motivating to, uh, your studies. Uh, this Hoffman was, uh, what was his first name? I forgot his first name. Yeah, sorry, I forgot his first name. Um, but he was a student at MIT um, and he was given, or the, he was given the choice by his professor to either uh, do a final exam um, or write a term paper. And uh, the task for the term paper was to uh, uh, show which of the binary codes is the most efficient one, and efficient in the sense that I will explain later. And uh, so he, he, in the beginning, had troubles and he couldn't really find or he couldn't prove that any of these uh, 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 binary codes uh, is efficient. So he was about to give up, but then he had this uh, very uh, uh, brilliant idea of, of building a binary code bottom up, which is sort of in contrast to what what his professor suggested to do. And he could prove that this actually gives a, an optimal uh, encoding of, of a string. Uh, and this is uh, yeah, named after him, the Huffman uh, code. And he yeah, showed also that this is better than what his professor suggested, Fano, uh, Robert Fano was, was his name, together with uh, Short uh, Claude Shannon. They worked on a, on a binary code that worked slightly different because they tried to construct this code top down and uh, Huffman, the student, proved that his code, Huffman code, uh, is optimal, whereas the one by Fano and Shannon uh, wasn't. So maybe that's a little more motivation for you and your, your homeworks. Um, but uh, let's uh, start slowly with this topic. So Huffman encoding, as I said, is used for MP3, for example. Not only MP3, of course, but it's a sort of a very uh, popular use case of this code. Chapter will be called uh, Huffman encoding. And it is used, as I said, in MP3 compression, where you compress an, an audio signal. Uh, the data that you're given in this case is a uh, string S um, over some alphabets, gamma. I'm going to write this by using a pen, I think, over. Alphabet gamma. Uh, 
so usually the string is very long. If you think of a, a signal from an audio file that you have sampled at regular intervals. And alphabets, the alphabet is typically also much larger than just the two binary values, uh, binary values, zero and one. And as I said, the goal of this is to come up with an encoding scheme, um, a binary encoding of gamma that results in a, sort of the minimal encoding length of the string S. So here's the goal, find the binary encoding of uh, gamma that results resulting in a minimal encoding length uh, SE. Length to denote using this symbol and SE will be the it's not very clear here. E is the encoded string. Okay, so here's an example. <clears throat> Let's say you're given alphabet gamma, which contains three letters in our case, A, B, and C. And uh, what will help you to come up with such a binary encoding is certain, some certain statistics uh, of your string. So your string will be composed of characters from gamma. And let's say the statistics are the following. So the number of uh, characters uh, of A will be 45, of B will 16, and of C will be two. Okay, here's an example encoding for that. Put encode A by zero, zero. So we have three letters, so we will it need least, uh, will it need, will lead We'll need at least two, uh, two bits, and we will use 00, zero to encode A, and we will use uh, zero, 01 to encode B, and we will use uh, one zero to encode C. And using this encoding scheme, the length of the encoded string will be two times 45, this is uh, using two bits for every A, and we have 45 A's, plus uh, two times 16, plus two times two, which will be, which will be overall 126 bits. So using this encoding um, shown here will uh, lead to an encoding of, us, an encoding of the entire string of length 126. Any suggestions how we could, uh, yeah? Yeah, so this is what we're given in the setting where we know for every character how many times it occurs in our string. And so given these statistics, with that encoding, we achieve a encoding length of, a one, of 126. Now this doesn't really, make use of the number of occurrences of each character it doesn't really make any difference for us. So no matter what the occurrences of A, B, and C are, such an encoding will always give you the same length. It will always give you 126 really, right? So why, why do we bother really about the number of characters in our string? Any suggestion what we could do differently? 
to make sort of explicit use of the fact that uh, A occurs many, much more often than, than C. Uh, I think I see where you're going. This was, uh, I think, a similar answer this morning. If I understood correctly, you would like to make use of uh, things like that the next 20 characters are all A's, and you would basically encode this by 20 something encoding A. Yeah, so this is a different class of uh, uh, compression codes that would try to find patterns in your data. In, in this setting, we're not trying to find patterns in your inputs, but you're trying to only use the general characteristics of uh, this input file that has certain occurrences. And it also doesn't mean that these characters occur uh, um, next to each other. It's not that you have 45 A's and then 16 B's and, and, and two C's, that it could be randomly uh, spread in your string. Any other suggestion how we could use make how we could make uh, use of these uh, occurrences without without trying to find patterns in S? No, the order is uh, not relevant for us. You only know that there's 45 A's, 16 B's, and uh, two C's, nothing else. I mean, we are given the text, uh, the, the string S from which we extract that information, but we're not using any information beyond that. This could be a more general setting where you know that your input data comes from a certain application, and this application has certain properties where you know that certain characters uh, occur with certain frequencies. So it doesn't necessarily mean that this is exactly the, the input frequency that you get. Yeah. Yeah, this would work. So this is the direction I wanted to go. You could, instead of using such a fixed length encoding where you would use the same number of bits for every character, you would use a so-called variable length encoding where you would try to, yeah, intuitively uh, use fewer bits for a character that occurs many times, and you would then be sort of willing to use more bits for a character that uses that, that uh, occurs fewer times. This is sort of the high level idea. That's why I didn't want to write this. So this is what I showed here before. I will add this now in front. This is a so-called fixed length encoding. Uh, I guess you see what it means in this example. And in contrast to this, what can we do really with a, a so-called variable length encoding? So what you suggested was uh, one bit for A, one bit for B, and then two bits for C. This won't work because you will introduce certain ambiguities that I will show you in a, in a second. Um, but what will work, for example, is that you're using uh, one bit for A, for example, zero. Um, and for B, you could use uh, one zero. And for C, one one. <clears throat> And then the length of the encoding would be one times 45, because now the 45 occurrences of A can be encoded by a single bit, plus two times 16, plus two times two, which would be 81, and therefore much shorter than the 126 bits that we needed with our fixed length encoding. Okay, but now I want to show you what you have to watch out for when you do this. Uh, you can introduce certain ambiguities. So be careful about ambiguities. The following kinds. Here's an example. 
And this example does use one bit for A and B. So if the code words were the following, would uh, encode A with a zero, B with a one, and C with a zero one. Then what do we do if I have, if we have zero one as a code? So if, uh, if your string is only two bits long and it says uh, zero one, there's no way for you to uh, distinguish a C from uh, string AB. Both uh, of these words would give you the same encoding um, zero one. So this is ambiguous. Because you can't distinguish uh, a zero one, which could be a C, but zero one could also be A followed by B. And so the, the, the real problem, I mean, so if you start reading this text in coded bits from left to right, the problem in such ambiguous cases is that you don't know where to stop. But right? you start reading from left to right, uh, you have read sort of the first zero, and you know this could be an A, but you might also need to continue to read zero one to read a C. And the, the way this can happen is only if uh, the code word for one character is a prefix of the other. Then this exactly then, uh, in these cases, this will happen. You start reading, and at some point, you don't know if you read the entire character, I mean, the encoding for, for the entire character, uh, or is this just a, a prefix of this character, or is it already sort of the ends of one, uh, at the encoding of a different character? And that's why we want to have uh, so-called prefix-free codes. Uh, the idea we wanna we need an uh, encoding to be prefix free, where uh, no code word is a prefix of any other uh, code word. So we need uh, our coding to be prefix free, which simply means that no code word is a prefix of another code word. Does this make sense to everyone? You need to have them prefix free. Uh, and the nice thing is that any prefix free code can be represented by a full binary tree. Full meaning that every node has either no child or two children. And uh, the idea is to uh, assign to every leaf one of your characters in your, in your alphabet and uh, try to read off the encoding word for that character by walking from the root of this tree uh, on this unique path to the leaf of this tree or to, to the leaf representing that character. And every time you walk left, so you choose the left child, there's an ordering, let's say, of these, of these children, there's always a left and a right child. Whenever you move left, you encode this using a, a bit of a, a zero bit. And whenever you walk right, you encode this using a, a one bit. So this is the whole idea. Uh, of uh, representing such a prefix free code as a, as a full binary tree. So we wanna use uh, a full binary tree. So full again, meaning that each node has either no or two children. Then we interpret the left edge leaving a node as uh, label zero, so zero bits, and the right edge will be interpreted as uh, label one. Um, the leaves of this tree will be decorated with the letters from our alphabet. We decorate um, the leaves with uh, the letters from gamma.
Then we said that the encoding of a certain letter reads off um, simply the edge labels on a path from the root to the leaf. And this can be shown intuitively. It's, it's, it's completely clear. I think if you uh, give it a thought, it's, it's clear that this will be a prefix free. Um, but you can also formally prove this, and I think that's what's done in the book. So this is guaranteed to be uh, prefix free. So let me show you an example. Such a binary encoding by a, by a full binary tree. Again, we have our uh, three letter alphabets, A, B, C, and we could, uh, and we can try to represent this encoding here, which is prefix free, as you, as you can see. Uh, we can represent this as a full binary tree as follows. We can have A as a, a child node of the root, and we have uh, another node from which we split into leaves representing B and representing C. And as we said before, left edges get a zero, right edges get a one. Okay, so now you can verify that uh, A will be encoded by a zero as before. Uh, B will be encoded by one zero and C will be encoded by one one as here. So this is the full binary tree representing the encoding that we had shown before for these three, uh, three, three letters. But of course, in principle, you can do this also alternatively in the following way. You can have uh, Did I remove something? Did you see anything? Is anything gone? No. Okay. So this is one way to do this. The other way is, uh, for example, to put B here and to put another node here that splits into a C and A. So this is an alternative encoding. Again, we use the same scheme of uh, zero bits to the left and one bit to the right. And in this particular example, B would be encoded by zero, uh, C would be encoded by one zero, and A would be encoded by one one, which is also um, prefix free. But as you can imagine, one is better than the other, and that's what we try to quantify next. But both are um, full binary trees, giving us prefix free encodings of uh, our characters A, B, and C. Any idea without calculating which one would be better in terms of the encoding length, which one of these two representations? If you had to guess without doing any calculations, which one would you pick to encode your, your string S? So remember that for string S, we had these statistics on the top and these trees. Uh, unfortunately, we can't put them on the same card. Yeah. Could be, and why? Right. And this is good because A is the one that really occurs the most. So we want to encode A by a short code word. Here we use a code word of length one, uh, whereas here we would have to use two bits for the same character 45 times. And if you plug in the numbers, you will see that this is true and give, it gives you a longer um, encoding length. So how do we quantify this? So which one is better? We want to know the encoding length and how do we read out the encoding length for such a given tree? We simply have to do the following. So let's say we are given more formally, we're given the encoding tree. 
and we're given the string S with a certain letter count, so the frequencies of every letter as before. Then the size of the encoding string is given as follow. Follows over so here, the encoding tree T and the string S. with uh, letter counts, so we know how many times each letter occurs. Okay. So we note the letter counts by F, L, um, for all letters L in gamma. In this case, we can uh, calculate the length of the uh, encoding string simply by summing over all letters in our alphabet. Um, how, how would you, so how do we write this here in this case? So let's say you're given a tree, the letter counts. Uh, how would you calculate the length of the encoding? using this notation of F. So you have to sum over all every character, take its frequency, how many times does it occur? This will be FL times the length of the encoding of the code word for, for character L. And the length of the code word is given by the so-called depth of the corresponding node in this tree, right? The depth here, uh, I'm not going to formally define this, but you know that the depth of a node is simply the length of the path from the root. So the depth of C is two in this example, and the depth of uh, A is also two. The depth of uh, B would be, would be one, which is equal to the number of bits that you're using to encode these. So this would be simply F L times the depth of L. So that's simply a sort of a different way to write the, the encoding length. And that's what we're trying to minimize. Right? If you want to find a binary encoding that minimizes this, this, uh, this number. Okay, so here's a, an example. I think this is the same tree that we had before with ABC. It's A, here B and C. How do we do that? Let's say, uh, we had, I think, 45 occurrences here, 16 occurrences here, and two here. Then this is simply um, the depth of A is one times the number of occurrences plus the depth of B, which is two times the number of occurrences, plus the depth of C, which is two times the number of occurrences, which would give exactly the same as before, 81. <clears throat> Okay, so no, no much, not much uh, magic here. It's the exact same as we did before, except that we are sort of reading out the, the coding length of a character simply as the depth of the corresponding node in this binary tree representation. And so now comes the, the, a crucial insight. It's a sort of a different way of writing exactly the, same, exactly the same thing, which helps you, which will help you to come up with a greedy approach to, to find such a binary encoding. Um, so even though we are only given frequencies for the letters in our alphabet, meaning frequencies for the leaves in this tree, it makes sense also to assign frequencies to the internal nodes of the same tree, which would simply sum up the frequencies of all characters that are descendants of that uh, node in this tree. Let me maybe just uh, sh let me show you this first. So in this particular case, in this tree, so we had the frequencies of A, B, and C, which are frequencies of leaves in this tree. But now I'm I'm trying to argue that we could also assign a frequency to this node here, to this internal node, 
by simply summing up the occurrences of, in this example, B and C. So this would be, in this case, 18. And then we need to simply sum up all these numbers across all these nodes in our tree to get the exact same cost, namely the encoding length of the entire string. And why is that? Because every time we encode a character in our alphabet that is a descendant of a particular internal node, we have to pass this internal node. And every time we pass this internal node, we output the bit that is written on the edge entering this node. So every time we want to encode B, we have to walk this path and output this one here that corresponds to the internal node. And then uh, we do the same for B and the same for C. We have a single bit. That's why we don't double count, but we really have to add these numbers 18 for the number of this bit and 16 for the number of this bit and two for the number of times we output this particular bit. And then we're sort of getting rid of this idea of looking at depths of nodes and, and so on. It's just an easier way to think about this because you only have to sum, sum over the num numbers uh, in, in all nodes of your, across over all nodes of your tree. Does it intuitively make sense to everyone before I write it down? Yeah, I thought so. But this is just a clever way to, to rewrite the same uh, cost function. So a clever rewrite is as follows. You want to label the internal nodes with uh, the sum of the descendant counts. We have the descendant counts. Um, uh, and in particular, what we said is that we are assigning every node except for the root. So for the root, we don't have to assign such a number because there's no bit that we will output once we start at the, at the root node. So for all leaves and internal nodes, V, Now a tree, we let the cost of uh, the particular node be simply the sum of the leaf nodes, the leaf node counts descending from that node uh, V. So the Cost of V is equal to the sum uh, of the leaf node counts descending from V. You can see in the above example here where I have, uh, let me just copy paste this. So if you do this, we will sum up 45 plus 16 plus 18 plus 2, which should give the exact same number, namely 81. The, based on this observation, the length of the encoding string in this case is simply sum. So we just did up there. 
over all nodes in our tree and we simply sum up the costs of these nodes. Okay, much easier. We don't have to worry about depths and, and stuff. We simply sum up all these numbers across this tree. Here so far. Now, the, if you use both formulations of these costs, so one based on the depth and the other one based on just the cost on every internal node, then we, come up, we can come up very easily with a greedy scheme. And the greedy scheme would do the following. It would start by selecting the two nodes or the two letters that correspond, no, sorry, the two nodes that correspond to the uh, letters with the lowest frequency. And it would uh, put them at the very bottom of this tree. This is based on the first objective, uh, on the first formulation of our cost function. So whenever we pick two nodes with the, the lowest frequency in, all, in, in our entire text, we want to put it at the very bottom of this, uh, of this tree. Why? Because if you didn't, you could simply swap them for another node at a, at a lower depth and decrease the total cost of this tree. You see that? It's simply because of that term here, right? Uh, we have the depth here and the sum that contributes to the total cost of this tree. And if I take the two nodes with the sort of the maximum depth, I want to have the smallest f there. And if it's not the smallest f, I can swap it to a, with another node with smaller depth and therefore uh, decrease the cost. So that's why the two lowest, uh, the two characters with the lowest frequency have to be at the very bottom to the maximum depth in this, in this tree. Okay, and this is, and how do we do this? Well, we start by, by putting these two nodes under a new node, which we will not change anymore along, uh, in, along the entire algorithm. So we start from individual nodes. There's no tree, there's every, every letter is represented by a single node. And then we just take the two nodes corresponding to the two characters with lowest frequency and attach them to a new node. And this will be, we, will, we know that this will be somewhere at the bottom of our tree. We don't know how the tree will look like, but this is our start. So maybe let's start with an example before we come to the, to the second uh, insight. So let's say we are given the following um, symbols and frequencies. Here's an example of uh, symbols and frequencies. We have uh, four characters, A, B, C, and D, that occur 20 times, 15 times, 10 times, and five times. And we start by representing every character by a single node that will be leaves in our final tree. So we have A, B, C, D. And just to remind us, we'll write down the frequencies of this letter, uh, 20, 15, 10, and five. Okay. And so by what I've just said, what we would do in our first step is look for the two letters with the lowest frequency, which in our case will be C and D, and connect them to a new node. Let's try to do that in, in the first step. We would connect C and D and connect them to a new node. And we know that this new node will be somewhere at the bottom of the tree because these are the lowest, low, lowest uh, that the characters with the lowest frequency. Okay. And now it's, it's sort of handy. It comes in handy to look at the previous objective, which is this one. Sort of this one, this formulation of the same objective. This is the same cost uh, really of the tree, just uh, in this, using this rewriting of using the cost source of internal nodes. And now if you look at what we have done uh, so far, we have connected these two nodes. And according to this other cost scheme, so this one, we will know that 
the cost of the final tree will be the cost of the two leaves, which is uh, 10 plus five. So we don't care about the depth. This is the trick here. We don't really know the depth of these two trees, but we know that C and D will each contribute the cost of 10 and five. And that the node that connects C and D will connect, uh, will contribute a cost of uh, 15 to the final scheme, right? So this is 15 because this is the sum of the descendants, it's 15. Okay, so whatever tree I will build, this will be part of our cost. We will have 10 plus five plus the cost of a tree with three leaves, where the three leaves are represented here by A, by B, and by this one new node. And that's, the, that's the entire story. So now we're, we have all the ingredients that we need for, for greedy. We know where to start. We have argued that this will be part of an optimal solution because otherwise we could swap two nodes. And now I'm telling you a way how to solve the rest of the problem, the remaining problem after fixing these two nodes, again, optimally, and then plugging in simply this part here into your final tree. Okay, so after doing this, you basically solve the same problem with three leaves of values 20, 15, and, uh, and 15. So if you do this in this particular example, what would uh, happen the next step? You would get, um, step, yeah would look as follows. We would connect uh, B to the new node that we have introduced because 15 and 15 are the, three, uh, the two smallest values, the two smallest remaining values among 15, 15, and 20. So this will be our new node. And we assign the cost of uh, this new node because we know this part of a tree will contribute uh, 15 plus 15, namely 30. So the cost of this node will be 30 and it'll be part of our final tree. And finally, last step. Last step, there's only two nodes left or one, yeah, two nodes, two components. And we again, connect them with a new node to obtain our final tree. Okay, so this is how we compute it. And what we get from this is an encoding that looks like this. We have A here, which we suspected because A occurs um, most often. We have B and C, no, sorry, B, and another node that splits into C and D. So it's the exact same tree as before with our previous interpretation of uh, assigning labels of zero and one to these edges. And therefore our encoding is the following for our symbols A, B, C, and D. Encoding of A will be a zero using the same scheme as before. So code of A is zero, of B is a one zero, of uh, C is 110 <clears throat> and of D is uh, 111. The total number of bits. Would be would be uh, the sum of the five, 10, 15, and the 20, 15, and the 30. And this would give hopefully 95. So here's 20, 35, 40, 50, plus 30 is 80, plus 15 is 90. Okay, so this is the total number of bits we need 
to encode these four characters really uh, in our string given these frequencies. And this is really a greedy scheme, right? That what we have done now is, is greedy. And uh, how do we show that this is optimal? We're not going to do this here in class, but what would you do if you had to show this, that this approach is, uh, is optimal? Let me first write down what we did. Uh, very short in just one sentence. So our greedy approach worked simply by continually merging the least frequent nodes until you have a binary tree. Okay. So I showed you a, a greedy algorithm for computing these binary trees with, uh, well, a certain encoding length. But how would you argue now that this encoding length that you're getting using this greedy algorithm is actually minimum? Okay, so this, and if you had to name this property in terms of a greedy scheme, what would that be? You need optimal substructure too, but I think what you described is the, the, the greedy choice. I think if I understood you correctly, what you're saying is that the choice we're making has to be part of an optimal solution. So the two nodes that we're connecting in the beginning and then each subsequent step has to be part of the optimal tree. This is a sort of greedy, greedy, uh, the greedy choice property that this choice is safe. And the second property we had to show, I mean, besides the fact that we are formulating the problem as a sequence of choices, second problem is the, or the second property we need is the sub optimal substructure. And the optimal substructure can also be easily seen because we're really building this tree up bottom, uh, uh, bottom up, uh, meaning that we're starting to merge two nodes and then we're not changing this anymore. So what's left is sort of an, an instance of the same problem as one leaf less. Right, so we merge two and then we resolve the same problem with one leaf less. And in the end, the, the entire solution is just, you just get this by plugging in the subtree that you have formed into the optimal tree of the remaining problem. And this is what this optimal substructure is all about. This is only a sort of an intuitive or, or hand-waving um, argument. You can prove this formally, and this is, this is uh, done in the book. But we have done this a couple of times, so I'm, I'm not going to show this here. But these are the things that we would have to show if you wanted to, sh to show formally that this actually gives a, uh, an optimal algorithm or an optimal binary tree in terms of the length, encoding length. So I'll just write this down, down vaguely. And if you're interested, you can uh, look it up in the book if you're interested in a, in a more formal proof. But it's, it's more important in this case, at least, that you get uh, this intuition because this also occurs very often if you build up trees bottom up that you have this optimal substructure property where you build a local structure by joining these two nodes, then you uh, represent or you sort of collapse this really conceptually into a new leaf. And then you build a tree using this new leaf and then just expand this leaf conceptually again in the end uh, using the structure that you have built previously. So this is exa exactly what we did now. So I'll just write this uh, vaguely as, uh, as follows since we uh, aggregated the tree at uh, each step and it's easy to check uh, that this uh, the bits optimal substructure
We also argue that we have this, uh, a greedy choice. Um, write this down. So this and uh, greedy choice guarantees optimality in this case. Okay, so um, let me write down this algorithm, this, uh, all the steps that we have done. And um, but every step we have to uh, select these nodes of uh, lowest frequency. How would you do this in, if you had to implement this? What kind of data structure would you use for that? I believe that you have done this actually in, when you uh, when you learn about Dijkstra's algorithm. Did you did someone say something? No. Q? Yeah, priority queues. So we use priority queues because the priority queue will contain a set of elements, uh, and you have keys for these elements, and you try to uh, in each step try to extract the minimal elements according to this key. Um, very efficiently, and you try to keep this uh, sort of in shape such that your next extract min will be uh, again very efficient. So this is this is done in in Dijkstra, but it's actually also done. Um, I'm jumping big a bit big, uh, back and forth, but it's uh, I think maybe good to to note this when we talked about Prem's algorithm, we also use uh, priority queues. So priority queues uh, in this case helped us to identify the next edge that you want to add to our minimum spanning tree. I think I forgot to mention, to mention this before. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. But in Prem's algorithm, in each step, we wanted to find some of the cheapest edge that connects us to the rest of the tree. And this can be done in a very, very similar manner to Dijkstra with a priority queue, except that the keys in Prem will not be sort of the length of the path leading to this, uh, to this node, but it will be only the length of the edge connecting a new node to our current tree. But otherwise, otherwise, Prem's algorithm is pretty much the same as, as Dijkstra's algorithm, uh, except that the meaning of these keys are a bit different. Okay, just like a little side note. But also in Huffman, uh, we'll, we'll use uh, priority queues to be able to quickly find sort of the smallest elements and smallest in terms of the frequencies. So we want to find the two elements with uh, lowest frequency. And again, for this, we're using uh, priority queues. We call this Huffman. And uh, this algorithm gets us input an array F uh, of frequencies of your n characters. Maybe let, me, let me write this down actually. So this is an array of uh, frequencies, frequencies from one to n. Okay, and this is really all we need to build a, an optimal binary tree. Uh, as we did in the example, we start from an empty tree. So let's T an empty tree initially. We initialize our priority queue also uh, using an ordering by F. At H, E, A, priority Q will be ordered by our frequencies. So we want to find the characters with lowest frequency in each step. Um, so first, we initialize our priority Q with the elements um, that we uh, want to encode. So we iterate over all our nodes, sorry, all our characters. And insert 
i into h. So I don't know if this is exactly the notation that you used when you talked about priority queues, but I think it's pretty uh, self-explanatory, this, this notation. And so we start from these individual nodes, and then each step we said that we are merging two of these components until only one component, namely the tree, remains. That means we have n minus one uh, iterations. So the next for loop will continue from n plus one to two n minus one. And you will extract the minimum elements twice from this uh, priority queue to get elements i and j. So i is equal to extract min. So is this what you used? Uh, is this the notation that you used for extracting the minimum element in the extra or in the priority queues? Ah. Um, so sometimes you would probably split this into find min and then delete the min. So extract min does both. It gives you the minimum element, but it also deletes, deletes it. Yeah, that's why I think I will stick to extract min. So it does both. It gives you the minimum element and it also deletes it. Extract minimum element in H. And uh, J, the second element, will be what we get after having uh, extracted I. So we again call extract min. And then once we have these two elements, what we did in the example is to join them under a new node. So we uh, put a new node K into our tree T. Which has children I and J. And note that i and j in the first iteration will be simple nodes, leaves that correspond directly to um, characters. But in later iterations, i and j will generally be the roots of uh, other subtrees that you have built previously. And then, uh, yeah, what, so based on this example, what else will we have to do in this iteration after uh, extracting the two smallest elements, putting them under nodes? What else would we have to do to keep uh, this algorithm working? Yeah. And put it back to the queue. Uh, and what? Okay, but which, which node would you put back in the queue? Right. This would be K, so we already have this node. You just have to define the key of that node, and the, and the key is what you said, uh, namely the sum of the uh, keys of the two other nodes, of the two children. And that's what we did exactly. Uh, so F of K now will be equal to FI frequency of I plus the frequency of J. And then we would simply insert this into the priority queue. Now solves of the same problem or continue solving this problem now with one leap, uh, one leap less. So we insert or one component less. Okay. What about the complexity of this algorithm? How slow or fast is it? Well, we can't really answer this without uh, talking about this priority queue first. So it depends on the implementation of this priority queue. So the complexity depends uh, on the implementation of the priority queue. And here's one way to do it. So we have heard of the binary heaps. So if you have, uh, if you consider a heap-based implementation of uh, of this algorithm.
then we know that insert will take a order of log n. And that extract min will also take order of log, uh, log n. So Hoffman will take So how much will Huffman take then? If you know that insert and extract min will take log n. Did you hear something? Yeah. Log n, you sure? Not. N log n, anything else? Yeah, n log n is the, is the right answer because you have uh, this loop here, which goes over n minus one uh, iterations. And you have uh, a bunch of uh, log n operations, these two extract mins, and these insert, they all cost log n. So this loop will contribute uh, order n log n. And the first loop, naively speaking, would take n times also the cost of insert, which is n log n. But you probably have learned that you can uh, initialize such a priority queue from n elements in uh, linear time in order of n, which for the total running time of this algorithm, Asymptotically speaking, makes no difference. But uh, yeah, in, in any case, you build the product in order n, and then the second loop costs uh, n log n. So the total running time will be n log n. So this will be order n log n. Does everyone agree with this? Questions? Because now I want to give you a little side note how uh, for, for sort of an, other, an, an indirect application of uh, this Hoffman encoding, namely in, in the context of uh, entropy. Who has heard of entropy before? Yeah. Anyone else? Entropy, yeah. So everyone has heard it. I remember also before I really first time wrote it down, I heard it many times and I had sort of a vague, uh, vague idea what it is. and and. Maybe it helps to, to once formally uh, derive it. Um, so let's say we want to have uh, this uh, side note on, on, on entropy. This will, this will be just a little side note how a Hoffman encoding sort of uh, can be used in, in the definition of entropy. We won't talk much uh, about entropy itself. There's many other aspects that we will not cover in this context uh, of uh, entropy. And so the, I, I like the motivating example in the book, which uh, talks about horse races. And so if you think about the, the uncertainty or the, the level of surprise um, of, uh, of an, the, the outcome of a certain event, and let's say the event is uh, sort of the outcome of a certain horse in a certain race, that you want to know if this horse you know, won or became third or fifth, um, and you have seen this horse uh, racing many, many times, and you know what positions it had in previous races. So if you saw that this race, uh, this horse almost won all the previous races, then the uncertainty for, the, um, for, the, for, for expecting this uh, horse to win again in the race that you're putting all your student loan on in, in this individual, in this one single bet, the uncertainty would be not too big. That, that doesn't mean that I'm, I'm recommending to, to make such a bet. Um, but if you had a different sequence of outcomes where we would see that uh, this horse would basically be everything from, from uh, first to, to, sec for, to, to last position, then sort of betting on this one outcome that it will win is actually much, uh, much less likely and you have a much higher uncertainty. So one way to quantify this intuitive, so intuitively the uncertainty is clear, but how do you quantify this? You could write down all the outcomes of, uh, of such an event, of uh, yeah, uh, the positions of a horse, a particular a horse in, in different races, or if you have a, 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 a dice that you're throwing, maybe the outcomes of, of a coin flip, 
um, and you write it down as a sequence of outcomes and you try to compress it. And then intuitively speaking, if there is lots of randomness, then there's a high level of surprise. And that means that you can not compress the sequence very well. On the contrary, if you have a lot of uh, similar outcomes, um, a biased coin flip, for example, that almost always comes out heads. If you write down all these heads, you will have you know, very uneven frequencies, and therefore you will be able to compress this string of uh, outcomes of events much, much better. And so the idea in this case is to, uh, to, um, to quantify this level of randomness uh, of a sequence of uh, outcomes of a certain event or the level of uncertainty um, by how much you can compress it uh, in, a, in a binary encoding. So in this, set, in this setting, let's say we have uh, n symbols. with certain frequencies. So how many times uh, did it end up position one, of course, how many times position four and so on. And uh, we want these uh, frequencies now to sum up to one. So they describe a, prob a probability distribution. And let's say we're pulling M values according to this distribution that is specified by P1 through uh, Pn. then one can show, but we won't show this, that the average number of bits you need to encode this string using the Hoffman encoding that we have just discussed is the following. We can show this by, um, by induction. using Huffman. is uh, as follows, you simply sum over all elements. Then you check how many times this uh, character or letter A occurs. And if M is large enough, it will occur M times PI times. So we're assuming that uh, the ith character really occurs m times pi times. And for large m, this will be, will be true. Times the logarithm of uh, 1 over this probability. Okay. So this is what you can show using induction, that using Huffman encoding, uh, you will be able to encode a string that is uh, obtained by pulling sort of these values according to the given distribution here will have this length. So if you can now consider a single draw from this distribution, so you take the average of uh, what's shown here, the average basically just meaning that you divide this by M. What you get is what you probably have seen many times before, a uh, single draw now would be Noted by H of P1 through Pn. Well, the same thing, except for M divided by M. Pi times log of 1 over Pi. That's what's called the entropy. And so this is the average number of bits that you need to encode 
a draw from a distribution that is specified by these values P1 through Pn. That's all I wanted to say about uh, entropy. I'm sure this is what you have seen many times. Um, and you know, this is the entropy and now you know sort of uh, how this is related to uh, Hoffman encoding because it's exactly the number of bits um, that you need um, to encode uh, the string of outcomes of such an event pulled from this, dis uh, this, this distribution. So when would, Maybe last question, uh, when is the, when do you think is the, so what distribution would maximize uh, the entropy? So when do you need the largest number of bits? Yeah. Yes, and what kind of distribution is that? Yeah, uniform. So for unit, uniform distribution, every uh, element occurs equally likely. You have no idea really to, to predict what's coming out. Uh, and that's why the number of bits that you need to encode such a series of events or series of outcomes will be maximized. Okay, um, I'll end here to be also in sync with the other class. And uh, next time we're gonna study a combinatorial structure, which will be helpful uh, to study or yeah, to, to study the performance of uh, 3D algorithms. Any other questions? Yeah. When will the grades be for? Are they not out yet? They should be out, yeah. I'm not, I wasn't involved in this, so I can't really tell, but I, I assume that they're out, yeah. And also I got a couple of requests in terms of uh, how well you are doing. So I'm on it. I have to somehow uh, port the, the grades from Gradescorp into Canvas, which I haven't done before. So I wanna do this carefully not to mess up things, but yeah, just so you know, I'm, I'm on it. <laughs>